presentation. So it's a great pleasure to have Alexander Rosenberg. He is a very accomplished artist with a, a Master's of Science in Visual Arts from MIT, did his BFA at Rhode Island School of Design, very uh, prominent figure in our field, uh, connected to the glass specialist world, but also cross-discipline. Uh, his art practice is, um, has had him teach and head the program at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia for a long time, seven to seven plus years. And now he's in Salem Community College teaching, lives in Philly. Uh, his work with the Proctor Fellowship will uh, uh, examine how glass as a material for survival in the, in the Anthropocene can, um, can be a solution for the challenges at hand and he'll be doing field work as well as uh, excavating some recycling uh, projects here in Canberra. The work currently that he's doing in Philly is supported by RARE, the Recycle Artist Residence that he's going to do and awesome Foundation Philadelphia Sculpture Grounds. So he's a busy man. Good morning, Alex. Good evening, Alex. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, thanks so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. So uh, I'll let you share your screen with everybody and, and let you take the floor. We have about 40, 45 minutes and then some questions. Wonderful. Here, let me get this uh, connected. Okay. Let's see. So it's still loading on my end. Wonderful. Okay, can you see that? Excellent. And and you can hear me. Maybe give me a thumbs up, uh, if you can. Awesome. Great. I'm busy just letting okay. people through into the wait room. I'll just. No, that's wonderful. Um, well, first, uh, thanks so much to you uh, for hosting this and to ANU um, and for, uh, you know, supporting this, this project with the Proctor Fellowship. I'm, I'm so uh, looking forward to getting a chance to, to kind of engage with you all uh, physically and to, uh, you know, in, in shared space after the social distancing uh, comes to an end. Um, but I'm also very pleased to um, engage with you this way uh, right now. This is actually um, kind of telling the stories about these projects is my favorite way to kind of uh, interface with people. Um, I like it more than having a show um, or, or uh, you know, show, showing work in real space. There's something uh, special about getting to tell the stories uh, that go with these projects. So. Um, I am working on getting used to this kind of technological mode. Um, there are things about it that I really like. Uh, one, for example, as Nadej mentioned, we do have like this kind of chat window which is going. So if people think of questions as the talk is going on, please feel free to um, enter them into the chat window and uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to answer them. Uh, at the end, um, I, I also, from experience, have learned that the kind of AV stuff can be a little bit laggy. So um, if, uh, you know, if, if people can uh, turn off their, their videos, that maybe that sometimes helps a little bit. And, and also, you know, just, just bear with me if we have a moment where we have to wait for a slide to load. Uh, so I will, uh, I'll get started talking about, uh, talking about glass. Um, this first slide that, uh, that I like to, uh, for a while, I'd like to start the talk with um, it's to show a little bit of what I refer to as my studio practice. Um, I, I love working uh, the kind of materials and processes associated with glass, uh, and glass blowing in particular is, is important to me. Um, these objects, though, that you see, I don't, I don't really claim to own any of them. They're kind of... Um, things that I try to imitate that I see in museums or, or books and things like that. Um, but uh, there's this exciting part of this practice, which is that glass, glass blowing, working with molten glass is a literal recording of a series of movements in space. And 
it occurs to me that if I take these historic objects and I make them perfectly, if I were to recreate them perfectly, it would not only be recreating an object, but it would also be reenacting a series of movements that another practitioner has done um, exactly, you know, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of years ago. And this kind of impossible connection to somebody uh, across distance and time is kind of at the root of my interest in this material, but also in kind of historic uh, research in general. Now, I, I also really like to refer to this as studio practice, which is a, a term that I think a lot of artists use, but I find it particularly apt for, for glass working um, because, uh, because of practice in the sense that uh, an athlete or a musician practices with repetition, um, developing muscle memory, being able to kind of perform these, these movements over and over again, because that's an aspect of what, of what we have to do. Um, but also this notion of kind of circling back uh, thematically and methodologically to the same materials and principles where glass becomes a framework for exploring uh, other media and subject areas. So um, talking about history and, uh, and kind of connections to the past, um, I guess like I ask a lot of questions and uh, that's one of the ways that I, that I kind of find topics and, and things that I, that I connect with. Um, in this case, this engraving I found in the Fogg Museum at Harvard and it's a picture of Benjamin Franklin and he's wearing this kind of, it looks kind of goofy to me, the fur, the fur hat. Um, and it's curious enough that I started uh, looking into it a little bit. And it turns out that Ben Franklin traveled to Paris in 1776, and he was this huge celebrity. Uh, the French people wanted to connect him to uh, the philosopher Rousseau, who's uh, depicted here in traditional Armenian costume. So the artist decided that by depicting him in a similar fur hat, they would kind of make him an enlightened figure. Um, I decided that if being depicted in this kind of outfit could make you enlightened, that I should make a version of that, uh, you know, of myself. So I made this image uh, digitally. I saw that kind of Rousseau and I had similar enough features that um, it wasn't that hard to, to kind of get my face in there. And I had this, uh, this image turned into a real painting um, using a factory in China that specializes in this, this sort of thing. Um, and this oil painting gets mounted on a wall in a gallery space. And there's a teeny little pinhole behind the eye of the, uh, of the painting where there's a surveillance camera which runs to a closed circuit um, TV uh, where whoever's looking at the, the painting, their face gets kind of transported to beneath another fur hat and they kind of get enlightened um, unknowingly, I guess, if that's possible. Um, also kind of serendipitous uh, historic material. This is, uh, this is a real round house that's located in Somerville, Massachusetts. And I stumbled upon it one day when I was living in the area. Uh, and I was just kind of walking through the neighborhood and I found this house is radially symmetric. And if you remember back to that first slide with that kind of practice that I'm doing that's going on in the background, um, glass blowing in particular is concerned with radial symmetry. Like I spend a lot of time trying to make stuff even when it spins. And uh, looking at this house, the first thing that popped into my mind was just like, maybe this would be the way a glass maker um, would build a house. And um, looking into it, I started to learn more about the man who built it. His name was Enoch Robinson. And um, his name actually is on one of the early glass presses, which is kind of America's contribution to, uh, to glass, uh, historic glass industry. Um, but also he was this kind of pragmatic hardware manufacturer by day and then he seemed to have this kind of active uh, fantasy life, I guess, by night, where he longed 
for this connection, the same kind of connection that I was looking at with that um, Ben Franklin illustration, he was interested in that same time period, same location. He made this house as kind of a monument to that interest. Um, you can see here, this is kind of the only uh, existing archival photograph of the interior of the house. It's, it's wallpapered with these scenic uh, wallpapers that are kind of trying to, uh, that are depicting these, the places that these people would have, would have spent time during, the, the, uh, during this period, these, these scenic uh, kind of pleasure gardens. And um, it was modeled after this, this, this structure, which is called the Broken Column House. It's, uh, it's located in, in France in, in, a, in a pleasure garden. And it's, it's a folly, which follies can kind of be different things. But in this case, it's a manufactured ruin. So it's this, this structure is made to look like there was once a giant ancient civilization. And all that remains is this kind of crumbling, truncated column. Um, so that's what he was kind of looking at and thinking about when he made this house. And I think the house was kind of the best he could do to, to get to this impossible, uh, to, to bridge this impossible distance, both through time and through space. Uh, so I made this kind of installation with the interest of trying to realize that desire, I guess. And it has a few different components you can see there's this uh, architectural model, uh, a glass cylinder inlaid with uh, the architectural detail of his house. And it has uh, a little electric circuit hanging down inside with a bright light. And you can see on the right, there's this, uh, th this two-dimensional image inside a window that's modeled after the, win the, the windows on the exterior of the house. And the, um, I got somebody uh, to go uh, online to go to the actual bro broken column house, which is still standing, and take a photograph for me out one of the windows to see what that landscape looked like. And uh, using the scenic wallpaper from that archival image of the inside of his house, I made a collage of what that actual location looked like. And what happens is, is people go and they, they stand inside of this room in complete darkness and they wait, and while they wait, their, their, uh, their eyes dilate, and then eventually this happens. There's this kind of bright flash, and where at once you were standing outside a model looking in, this thing inverts itself, and you're kind of inside uh, a space looking out. The, the shadows line up with that, um, that image on the wall, and um, in a way, it's as if you're kind of transported to the, the location that, uh, that this guy uh, wished that he could go to. Now, the other thing about this is that uh, it doesn't, the flash is very, very brief. There's not really time to visually navigate uh, the detail projected onto the wall. Instead, there's this phenomenon called after image, where if anybody has ever uh, stood in a dark room and flashed the flash of a camera, uh, there's this phenomenon where you can kind of close your eyes and the, this image is temporarily burned onto your retinas, which, which in my mind is, is something uh, approaching everybody having the same dream or vision. So there's this other um, aspect of glass which appeals to me, this very kind of performative aspect, which I kind of touched on in the beginning. Um, one thing that... Um, as a person who, who does this and travels from place to place, there's often uh, this kind of demonstration component when you go to different studios and, and different schools. And um, I'm always kind of thinking about how to make something out of that. You know, I, I mean, there is teaching is something, but also like how to how to make uh, how to make something else out of that performance. So what you see here is an interface. It's kind of outdated now. I'm not sure if, um, if anybody will recognize this, but it's called Max MSP. And it's kind of a visual interface for kind of programming AV stuff to go together. It would be like if you were a really uh, high-tech VJ in the late 90s, this would have been you know, your tool of or early 2000s. This would have been your tool of choice. 
So what's happening here, and I think you can see my cursor, uh, is there's a, a webcam going that's watching me blow glass. And it's posterized, which makes it a little bit easier for the computer to see the different colors. And you can see here, I kind of select um, a range of colors. And the computer tells me where those pixels are going on the screen to x, y coordinates. And those coordinates go through a little bit of compression so that they can stay in, uh, in the audible spectrum. And they go to the notes on a piano keyboard. And what ends up happening is glass blowing, the act of glass blowing becomes a song. So I'm going to, um, this might take a second, give you a little sense of what that might sound like. That's not that easy to listen to in the best case scenario. Um, so I've, I have one more kind of jerky video for us to, us to get through, uh, but I'll talk over this one. Um, so the next thing uh, to do once that kind of music was composed, I, I was really interested to see what it would look like. And I found this piece of software called Witty that's good at listening to a single instrument and transcribing it to uh, musical notation. And when this thing was all written out and printed in the kind of normal size of sheet music, it ends up uh, a piece of paper that's about 10 feet tall by four feet. Um, and you can see it's, it's pretty, pretty complex. Uh, and to me, here you can see it's, uh, it's installed and I, I've never shown it in a place that has a tall enough wall for it. And I, I kind of like it that it spills down onto the floor. Um, at the very base of it, you can see that's the object that was being, that was being made. Um, and to me, even though it's a little bit fanciful, uh, it's exciting that this very simple looking object contains all of this complex information. And the next thought would be, um, you know, can that be reverse engineered? Like, can we, with enough pianos, play that cup into existence? Um, if anybody has a suggestion for how to do that, I would love to hear about it. So, uh, moving, moving forward, um, as I said, there's this kind of practice of making glass that's going on in the background while all these different projects are going on. And, um, one year, I, I just started wondering what that looks like, what all that glass looks like. So I just decided that I would save everything for, for one year, every um, technical demonstration, uh, you know, teach, teaching object, everything that I do just for practicing or uh, something that I saw that I want to try, try to re recreate, uh, I kept them. And I wasn't really sure, I didn't really have a plan for what I wanted to do with them. I just wanted to kind of see what, what that was. And at the end of the year, I took all the stuff, um, I arranged it really carefully on the table, I started playing around with it, and I found that with a single light source, I could compose a shadow and I could use these objects to make, uh, to make a self-portrait. Um, but I, I, that didn't, it didn't really feel complete to me and, um, while I was kind of playing around with all this stuff, there was also this kind of um, nagging concern, I guess, about the, this kind of uh, performance of, of masculinity that kind of occurs in, in the uh, glass studio all around, these different kind of uh, permutations of that. And I always thought it was um, 
in some ways problematic, in some ways kind of comical. You know, there's this kind of trope that like the machoist guy would make the most like frou-frou, uh, delicate kind of uh, object. And I just, um, I wanted to engage that some way. So well, while thinking about that, um, I found this, uh, this, this travel journal from when I was, uh, when I, when I was a kid and uh, I was lucky enough to uh, go on a trip to Venice and we went to the, uh, I saw this, this sculpture uh, by Marino Moroni called Angel of the City. And I think I was 11 years old at the time. And um, this is, this is this, the sculpture. And uh, I just, I thought it was like the best piece of art I had ever seen, or at least I, I was fascinated by it. And um, just finding this, uh, you know, and I didn't really, it didn't, the memory didn't stay with me, but as an adult, I kind of rediscovered this thing. And what I found was that this, uh, when this piece, when this sculpture was commissioned in 1947 by Peggy Guggenheim, uh, believe it or not, one part of it in particular was controversial. And um, to deal with that controversy, uh, it was commissioned with the phallus to be removable. It was uh, threaded and screwed into the sculpture. And uh, depending on who would come to the museum, you know, like if the, the Pope came down or something like that, you could take off this, uh, this, this penis and put it in a little you know, cigar box under the front desk and uh, wait until it was safe again. And um, knowing that, you know, all these other questions kind of occurred to me, like, what's the cutoff for who it's appropriate for and who it isn't? Um, are there different sizes for different guests? Um, they eventually had a lot of problems with it getting stolen. And you can see here that it was eventually uh, welded on permanently. Also, I was, fortunate to get a chance to return to Venice um, this year. So I got this, these photos are taken from, uh, you know, me, me actually being there in person recently. Um, this is also just from going back a little detail that I never noticed. The horse has a little something going on in the back too that I feel like kind of uh, vibes with the whole rest of it. So, um, so anyway, I figured out how to uh, finish my, my project. And what you can see is, um, there's this overhead projector, which is the source of lighting for the sculpture. And uh, it's littered with the sketches that I worked from to make the different objects. And then there's also like uh, a pencil that's um, seemingly carelessly strewn on there, which uh, makes this one errant shadow. Uh, this piece was shown, uh, I was fortunate that this, this got to be part of um, a couple exhibitions in Europe in 2012 and uh, 2013. And at the end, it ended at uh, a museum where there was a kind of didactic, didactic card that people were allowed to take when they would come to the exhibition. And the card would give them uh, entry to the exhibition again on the last day. And uh, they, could, they could come in, line up on the very last day of the show, each person could take one of the glass objects away until all that remained was that kind of errant uh, phallic shadow. thinking about the way that that piece resolved itself, uh, I started thinking more about like, I, I wanted to start designing the ends of work uh, that I make. Like, you know, we spend so much time thinking about the way that things get made and the things come into existence and, and there's all this um, infrastructure and, and kind of methodology around conservation. Um, and I wanted to think more about like the kind of the depth, uh, the depth of the work that I make. So this one is kind of an example of that. It's, um, it's made using this uh, wonderful phenomenon where when you make blown glass, typically, uh, I'm sure many of the, much of the audience members know this, it, it has to be annealed. It has to cool slowly because different thicknesses of the glass uh, expand and contract at different rates. So as it cools uh, to room temperature, that can create, create a lot of stress and cause the glass to crack. Um, there's this kind of trick that you can do though, when that we use, uh, that I use in teaching sometimes where if you make a piece of glass and it's, it's relatively thin, you can just drop it into water and it cracks all over relieving that stress. Uh, but also that contraction of the material, it like sucks the broken pieces together. They hold together like pieces of a puzzle. 
and it makes this very fragile, but also, you know, uh, kind of strong, or at least it's not going to crack or change any more than it already is. It makes these objects. So I made these, um, this was for an exhibition in Virginia. I made these objects that were treated in this way, and they're cavity packed in this crate that just has um, one of the walls of the crate is plexi. And as it moved from place to place, these objects kind of deteriorate um, as kind of a document of the way that they move through space uh, until they're, they're nothing but just the empty cavities and kind of glass, glass fragments at the bottom of the crate. Um, so one, another thing, you know, people talk about glass making as this kind of addictive process. And I think part of it has to do with um, these, this kind of notion of these idea of these perfect forms that uh, practitioners, or at least I strive for. And um, this, this piece is kind of looking at this idea of equivocality. Um, I, I'm not, I can't remember 100% like how I started working with this, but I ended up with this piano and uh, this piece is called Almost Middle C. It's a one note piano. So I took a upright grand piano and I just cut away everything but that middle key and all of the guts behind it that make it work. And uh, one of the things that I discovered when I was looking inside the piano is at that point in the piano, when the hammer hits the string, it's not one string, it's actually three strings. And it's not they're not all tuned to the same thing. Like the, the middle one is supposed to be dead on and then one is a little bit flat and one's a little bit sharp. And this is actually like pleasing to the human ear. Like if they were all uh, perfectly tuned to a C, it kind of wouldn't sound right. And it's one of the reasons why people say like piano tuning is an art. Um, so I was interested in that equivocality and this, this whole apparatus, what it does is it hits a, uh, it hits a wine glass that I that I made as as best as I could to resonate uh, with that with that middle C. It dangles from the uh, the strings that used to make that note. This uh, this piano was played for 103 years before I got it and uh, ripped it apart. And when I pulled up the the keyboard, I, there was just all this disgusting nastiness like. Uh, nail clippings and hair and skin fragments and things. So I was kind of, I was grossed out and I went to go get the shop back to suck it all up. And while I was going for it, I thought to myself, like, you can only make this material by playing a piano for 103 years. Like, it's actually very valuable. Like, to recreate this stuff would be a huge um, undertaking. So instead of getting rid of it, uh, I made this reliquary, um, which is based off of something from Corning's co collection from the 17th century, which would have usually been used to hold the skin or a bone fragment of a religious uh, figure. This one, this one is called, hold your hands in front of you about eight to 12 inches away from you at eye level. Point your index fingers toward each other, touching at the fingertips. Now look through your fingers into the distance behind them. This is, um, if you have never done this before, I encourage you to do it right now. Um, this is actually a great time to do it because for the most part, nobody can see you. Uh, if you do what it, the instructions tell you to do, I'll go back to the instructions, you'll see this uh, optical illusion of this little double-ended finger uh, floating in the air in front of you. It should look a lot like this. Um, this image, yeah, that's, that's it. Give it a shot. This image is unaltered. It's, uh, it's just a photograph. It's not been photoshopped. It's, um, and I, I wanted to create an optical illusion that's created by binocular vision using a monocular tool, just a, a regular camera. And the way to do that was to make this thing which uh, I know skeeved everybody out a little bit. When, when I was making it in the studio, we were referring to it as the finger turd. Um, I, there's something about it that's a little bit gross, but um, the, the way to create that illusion of, of the texture and also the translucency of human skin was with, with glass, the only material that could um, really kind of uh, mimic the human, human skin in that way. 
So that's, uh, that's cast lead crystal. Um, you know, some of these, some of this work that I've been making in the last like uh, four or five years is starting, I think, to have more relevance now as we're kind of dealing with this, this pandemic and, and some of the stuff that's coming up in the studio. This one, um, it's, it's meant to be a little bit playful, but it's also in some ways uh, sincere. It's, uh, there's, it's a um, glass inscription on this thin piece of float glass leaning against the wall. That's kind of what I would like it to say on my, uh, on my tombstone. And uh, the way that it works is there's this very, very fine etched detail into that glass. It really can't be read on the material, but it can be read as a shadow. And this, this candle with this kind of big boiling flask projects these lines of light that allow you to read one line of, of type at a time over a very long period of time. It reads, uh, Alexander Rosenberg, he tried. Um, also, as we kind of, this was in some ways, uh, I guess like premonition of uh, social distancing. It's, uh, I, I live, in Philadelphia, and I live in a neighborhood that's uh, it kind of uh, fell out of popularity for a long time. Now it's popular again, but I live right near an abandoned coal power plant, and uh, I think now it's being turned into like luxury condos or something like that. But for a long time, it was this defunct kind of monument to to uh, to, to the uh, resources of the city, and uh, the neighborhood was really dark. And I was kind of thinking about public space and, and ways to um, kind of engage with the neighborhood. Uh, and I wanted to do something that brought some light back into the neighborhood. So I made this big neon sign and it's mounted in the top of my house. That's where I live. And uh, it hooks up to me when I sleep and it beats with my heartbeat. Um, you can see down the street there, that's kind of the center of the city. And those tall buildings have beacons on the top of them. So I like to think of it as kind of communicating with these beacons and the rest of the city. And it has actually become kind of a, um, in some ways, or for a while, it became kind of like, you know, the neighbors knew what was going on. They'd ask, you know, if it was off for a while, if I was okay, or, you know, if I was out of town, stuff like that. Um, now, I think it even is more like this way to kind of uh, share something that's in a way very private, like this very interior process without coming in contact with other people. Um, this is another one that, uh, it's kind of slowly progressing, but, um, it was influenced a lot by the, uh, the 20, the results of the 2016 election. I was working, uh, I was putting together this, uh, I, I always wanted to kind of do something with the glass, with glass pipes, like for the cannabis industry. I've always been fascinated with, um, kind of alternative economies and like de facto currencies. And uh, I knew that people making these glass pipes, like they were very valuable. And I was trying to learn a little bit more about why. And it, it, as I kind of got into it, it I, I learned that they were becoming this kind of de facto bullion for this alternative economy where like as, as cannabis, recreational cannabis was becoming legal state to state, um, but it wasn't federally um, sanctioned yet in the States. So like banks didn't want to take the money. Um, armored transports didn't want to move the money. There was like this giant kind of cash uh, economy that nobody really had anything to do with. And um, in a way, I thought it was very beautiful that like all of the, um, the kind of people in this industry decided, you know what we want to use to store our money in is, is art. Uh, so these, these pipes started becoming kind of uh, in one way, and it's a little different now. This is like a little, um, a little bit of an older uh, look at that economy. But so I wanted to figure out a way to trade, to, to participate in that economy without um, necessarily being kind of immediately part of that community. And um, I made this kind of invitation where I started making these, uh, I started making these coins and I, I made this um, with some help, this uh, kind of contract that allowed 
this coin to be val uh, equal in value to uh, a glass pipe from a different uh, artist. And we would sign this, this contract in ink that was made out of uh, cochineal uh, red, like the first red, and, uh, and cannabis oil. And um, the kind of pipe would match the value of the coin. And I'm starting to, in fact, it's really kind of coming together now. I'm starting to amass these, these pipes and they're going to be uh, networked together into this kind of giant super bong, which is going to be uh, sold to raise money uh, to support uh, the civil rights of people who are incarcerated for nonviolent drug uh, offenses. You know, so while as the um, as this kind of cannabis industry is becoming this like big white collar and very white um, kind of corporate. Uh, entity, there's still a lot of people, and of course, like, um, uh, and people in co of color who are uh, still kind of suffering from from the same the same kind of activity from a long time ago. So this project uh, aims to, to try to support that. So uh, moving on with a little bit more uh, public projects, and again, talking about uh, glass as this kind of material to, to look uh, as, as an approach to other kind of sub subjects and methodologies. This, this, is, uh, this is called uh, the Built Unbuilt Square. It was commissioned as part of this uh, curatorial project called Monument Lab, which was asking artists like what is the appropriate uh, contemporary monument for the city of Philadelphia. And I was really fortunate to be involved in this project. Um, Philly is a planned city, and uh, just like Canberra, actually. And uh, the um, each each artist initially was kind of paired with a square. There are five squares uh, in Philadelphia, and of all those squares, Rittenhouse is the most kind of chaotic. It's the one that um, it just changed so many times. It started as as a place. Uh, Kind of a rough neighborhood and now it's kind of one of the most expensive places to live in the city um it's had lots of things that that have been like proposed and changed it was like a trash dump for a while it was like a training ground for the revolutionary army um and so that was the one that i got i got paired with and uh one of these qualities that's kind of inherent to glass is this idea of absence and presence you know something that's able to be there and not be there at the same time uh, I decided to engage the site. I wanted to use augmented reality to show everything that had been like proposed but didn't happen, everything that had been built and taken away as if it was all there kind of layered on top of one another. And what ended up happening, I, I had these, this augmented reality interface and these coin operated viewfinders. And when you look through, you could see the park, uh, the square as it is overlaid with these different kind of historic instances of these different um, representations of some of its different permutations. So I have these 3D videos that I, I'm just gonna kind of drag, I'm just gonna drag through one since we have a little bit of a laggy uh, situation, but just to give you kind of a simulation of what it would be like to look through. I used um, people that work in the video game industry to help me with the interface and the, uh, and the animation. So it has that kind of video gamey quality. Um, and a lot of this stuff, especially the, the black and white stuff, it comes from just from written accounts, you know, there, uh, so like there was these written accounts of this albino deer. Um, there's kind of lore that this billy goat sculpture, sculpture comes to life at night. You can see some of the different uh, types of uh, plants that used to be there. The great chalk wars of 1914. Uh, there was a uh, observatory that was uh, that was proposed and never was uh, was built. Um, you can see that off to the right there. Um, you c this one also, I won't scroll through it, but there's people burning their draft cards uh, from the Vietnam War. The first Pride Parade uh, in Philadelphia originated there. Um, so getting more into kind of contemporary projects, uh, you know, a lot has changed for me in the last couple of years. And, uh, and I think right now it's, it's really kind of crystallizing in this way that um, 
you know, the effects of the Anthropocene are really, really showing the way that um, people living in the world is uh, affecting it in terms of climate and, and other effects. And it's making me kind of question a lot of what I do in terms of uh, object making. And I'm inclined um, to, to really look at that uh, critically, like what materials I use, um, you know, how, how they come to be. And, and I'm, I'm less interested in making, uh, in making new stuff. Uh, in this case, and I'm more interested in kind of trying to deal with the situation that we're in, in, in whatever way that might be, but um, in many cases, kind of acquiring and sharing knowledge as kind of, as kind of a practice to, to talk about uh, where we are globally and, um, and how we're going to move forward. In this case, uh, there's a great institution in Philadelphia called Eastern State Penitentiary. It's um, it's unique. It's the first penitentiary. It's a panopticon. If uh, anybody here has like gone to grad school and read Foucault, uh, this is the pan panopticon that uh, that he writes about. And uh, it is at once a historic site museum, um, a kind of social justice prison reform advocacy uh, institution, and a fine arts venue. Um, and as a hobby climber, I always looked at those walls. It's in the middle of the city and wondered uh, if they could be climbed. I, um, you know, a, a lot of times the connection to this work, it's not apparent until kind of after, but remember that very first uh, idea that I was talking about, about glass blowing and reenactment. And uh, for me, being able to move through this site in an unusual way and kind of use the architecture with my body ended up being a really exciting and unusual way to connect with specific uh, characters from the past. So what I wanted to do for this project is I wanted to, I wanted to climb this, I wanted to climb the prison as if it was a natural, uh, a national, natural site and I wanted to make a book about it and uh, shockingly amazingly the institution accepted the proposal and uh, allowed me to, to do it um, and you can see me here on the, on the north wall the walls are made out of Wissahickon schist which is the the type of stone you will find if you go outdoor climbing in the area and um, here's an aerial view of eastern state this is that panopticon that I was discussing where it's um, Oh, I hope I do this properly. Uh, it, it's it's a, a, a way, it's a panopticon. It's like an architectural mode of, of that allows a lot of control with one person over a large population. So you can see uh, it's kind of looks like a wagon wheel and with a single guard in the center, and all, of the cell, uh, all of the cells next to one another on each side of the different cell blocks that radiate, the promise of being able to be seen um, gives a lot of control over the, over the population with a very small uh, staff. You can see here's a drone footage. That's, that's me sitting on the wall on the bottom with a, with a white helmet. Um, and it's just, again, incredible that this, this structure is in the middle, it's in the middle of an urban center. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the weirdness of that in a second. But some of the kind of um, serendipity about the proposal uh, Eastern State closed its doors in 1972, which is the same year that this Chouinard equipment catalog was published. This is what would eventually be Patagonia. And um, in, this, uh, in this catalog, there was this kind of important essay called The Whole Natural Art of Protection, where it was um, educating its readership about this, this idea of clean climbing, which was both uh, type of gear, you know, that it, that it wanted to to, um, to share with the world, but also an ethic where this kind of leave no trace ethic um, where, uh, you know, everybody, people were interested in natural conservation, but um, people were kind of drilling into and chipping away at rock and clean climbing suggested that rock was a natural resource to preserve, just like animals and plants and um, other aspects of the landscape. So um, the, the kind of ethics of clean climbing overlay really perfectly onto the, the kind of conservational restraints of a site like Eastern State, which is both um, 
it's, it's kind of a, a ruin, which is, is trying to, and it's also a museum. So there's all this kind of conservation um, of both built and natural going on at the same time. And this project kind of sits squarely at, at that imagined divide. This is a cover of the book. Um, so I ended up climbing uh, 13 different routes on different parts of the exterior of the wall. This image, this is my favorite uh, archival image from the, uh, from the prison's collection. In the 1940s, when there was a, an escape, and there were many escapes from this prison, um, this was the method of notation to show how people, how people escaped. And you can see, um, this, is, this is what I ended up using to kind of mark the different routes in my book. Uh, finally, there was an installation in the cell of all the gear, which I made using materials that were available to people uh, when, when, they were, uh, when they were incarcerated. So <laughs> we're getting close to the end. Uh, I can see that I'm, I'm a, little bit, uh, a little bit over time, so I'm going to race through, race through here quick. But um, there was a very a, a recent uh, weird uh, experience that I had, which I'm not really sure where it kind of fits on the map of professional activity where I went on a, a Netflix series called Blown Away. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's actually like a surprisingly good experience. I'm going to like quickly show you the, the things that I made while I was on that series. Uh, this is a, it's called a lacrimatory, it's a tear collector. Uh, they asked us to respond to a photograph. Uh, so I had a picture of, of my dearly beloved uh, former dog who had passed away. I wanted to make an object that would allow me to kind of look look at the photograph closely. So if you, this thing gets filled up with tears, it becomes a lens and you can see the uh, photograph. This is a, a dining set for a particular dish. Um, this one, and I'm a little bit, uh, I wish I had done a better job of making it, but th it's actually related to the work that I'm kind of interested in pursuing in Canberra. It's, um, the lighting design for kind of like inevitable uh, <laughs> infrastructure and economic collapse. So uh, it's for electric light, but it can accommodate candles when the lights go out. This is a decanter set for uh, absinthe. Big giant pill bottle, <laughs> not much more to say about that. Um, this was, uh, I was paired up with Janusz Pozniak and uh, this duality, we wanted to make something that looked heavy, that was light, and something that was uh, that looked light, that was heavy. So we had all of these soap bubbles, which weighed a ton, and then we had these kettlebells, which were actually very light, and they were kind of balanced and possibly on this teeter totter. This one's called uh, Disappointment of the Tropics. It's also relevant because, like this, this kind of uh, the research that it's based on is 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 uh, kind of local to the Australia surrounding region, but. Um, it's about this um, kind of mistaken notion of uh, 19th century collecting when, when people would travel to the tropics and expect to see everything in bloom. And it would in fact be this kind of wilting, decaying, brown, you know, kind of stinky mess. Uh, it's the opposite of what they had cultivated in these glass houses back in Europe where everything was kind of made to bloom at the same time. Also these specimens that kind of really resist uh, collection and this is largely, you know, based on the work of uh, my partner, Elaine Ayers. Um, you know, nine out of 10 things would come back wilted. And there was a device, which I'm interested in, called a Wardian case. It's like this kind of portable greenhouse that people would attempt to transport these specimens in. And the large glass houses we see in Europe are actually based on this vessel. Um, and the last one, this one, uh, this was the one that I actually left on um we were asked to do something about a body in motion and i was thinking about john cage and and kind of when a body is still like the processes that are still that are still kind of going on inside of a body so um this one you see it's uh it's lungs and it's an optical device so small lungs on one side big on the other if you spin it they kind of appear to uh fluctuate a little bit um i'm gonna just skip over this and, and uh, end on this one, just to show you a little bit. Um, the work that I'm planning to do uh, is looking into the history of glass as a tool for human survival um, in, in the Anthropocene. And uh, you can see there's all of these different, um, different examples of how the material is used to kind of uh, address different needs of the human body um, in, in, in the field. 
Uh, you can see this is a, uh, it's a fishing buoy, um, water filtration. This one I love, it's a, um, it's a minnow trap, which is very similar to this fly catcher. Um, a solar still for purifying water, uh, a lens for starting fire. And in the upper right, you can see actually like contemporary napping. Uh, people love to use uh, the bottoms of bottles. So I want to kind of look at glass as this material that's both kind of integral or, or has been integral for, for kind of human uh, primitive survival practices, but also as something that's ubiquitous in technological waste um, and unwanted, you know, in the recycling industry because glass is it's so heavy. It's so, uh, it requires so many resources to transform um, and, and try to think about how we might be able to um, bring value to that moving forward. Uh, so I think I will leave you, whoops, I think I'll leave you there. Oh, there we go. And uh, open up for questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and everybody who's been joining in as, as the talk had started. So uh, welcome. And um, yeah, what a great account of a really huge scope of inquiry, but with really strong themes that have been recurring throughout, throughout the whole history of your practice. Um, not, not the least of which is uh, really examining closely the, um, the potential of the material and it's very kind of the drive of your practice as methodology to expand on other methodologies of inquiry is really interesting that kind of parallel that you chime through throughout your talk um, uh, I suggest that you guys um, could possibly um, unmute as you want to ask questions um, and there's the chat forum which um, I was proposing you flag questions do you want to we can't see everyone at once so perhaps um, using the, stop the my chat share. yeah using the chat on. that's great you can flag perhaps your interest in asking a live question pre if and you want to go that way there's too many participants to see them all on one screen i think <laughs> unmute isn't that uh, yeah want to unmute just perhaps as you want to ask questions unmute yeah and uh Yes, uh, so Jim, yes, there will be a recording available. I, I um, will be posting that on the Facebook page of the Glass Workshop as soon as I work out the best way to extract it from a cloud store and edit it. So there will be a, a link to the video as well, which we will make available. I'll just give a couple minutes for people to flag their questions. I have some, but you know, I yeah, I mean, yeah, take, take your time. I know there's like a lot of, uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, you know, one thing that has been kind of common is, uh, I know people, many people sometimes have questions about like the, the blown away experience. I know I didn't really get a chance to talk about that very much. Um, I'd love to talk more about like you know what uh, the plan more, more about like what the plans are for the for the residency um, yes well I'm, I'm very conscious that um, you know it's it's close to 9 p.m. in Philly I don't know where everybody is um, if you want to share your location in the forum that would in a in the participants chat that would be really great for us to record where people have been before you head off um, but um, Yes, there are some, some themes that you touched on that I suspect will be informing the way you deal with these objects um, or these devices for survival in your residency here in Canberra. For those who didn't hear the first five minutes of our chat, um, Alex will be coming to conduct his residency in Canberra as part of his awarded fellowship, which is the Proctor Fellowship. There's a link at the top of the chat to the information about the fellowship. It's a really, uh, we are so thrilled to have him come to Canberra. Uh, it's an annual award that is on a binal basis awarded to an international uh, artist working with glass, artist or designer. And um, Alex is the recipient this year. So there's a little bit of an unknown as to when he will be able to join us 
because of <laughs> closed borders and lots of complications in the world we are now seeing form in front of us, uh, with us in our homes. Uh, but yeah, he will be in Canberra later this year. Uh, the devices you talk about in this last image you discussed are the stepping point to an inquiry, which I think you mentioned in your proposal will rely on engaging with field work, which is in nature, in our environment here in Canberra, which, and in Australia, which um, as, as international news shared earlier this year, has been under threats from all kinds of things. So, um, yes. Do you want to expand a little bit on, on perhaps the, the things that will be informing that, that work? Yeah, from, and, I, I actually, and I, see, I see one question that says, is there a particular starting point, an object or plan for a first object for the residency um, in the workshop uh, that I have in mind or have been thinking about? And um, it's, you know, again, I, I have to say like how uh, kind of appreciate, appreciative I am uh, for, for kind of ANU uh, to, to like really be the kind of the first to take on, uh, take on this project, which I've been kind of proposing in different permutations for, for a little while. Um, but yeah, this, this year is going to be kind of a, a good, um, a, a few different permutations leading up to what happens in, in, in uh, Canberra. The first is this residency at Rare, which is called the, which is the Recycled Artist in Residence program in Philadelphia at Revolution Recovery, which is a wonderful program. Um, any uh, artists, and they, they do, it's for uh, open to international artists. So uh, I encourage people to look into it if you have an interest in kind of um, waste in industry recycling um, and, uh, and art. So I'm going to be working with them also kind of a little bit up in the air with what's going on in the world right now, but um, to learn more about like the recycle, the, the kind of tools um, and practices and resources of the recycling industry, uh, you know, like where stuff comes from, where it goes, some of the ways that different, different places deal with this material and uh, to start, to start learning um, about some of the ways to source some of the material. I want to make a, a book with this project also. And I'd like it to be printed entirely on kind of um, locally sourced recycled uh, paper. So finding out that a little bit. Um, and then uh, the other part of this is going to be kind of skill building and um, learning from experienced uh, practitioners of these kind of primitive survival skills uh, in, different, in different areas. So it's my hope when, when I arrive at a new site to kind of engage um, the local population and people who, who do this kind of stuff professionally to learn like what are kind of uh, the, the tools that are uh, the tools and kind of methods that are common to the area and, and try to find the connections between um, that and this kind of uh, surplus material that would be uh, available in the form of, in the form of waste. Uh, so it's kind of, it's exciting to me in the way that it's, it's both kind of, it's not just a way to kind of make something, but it's a way to kind of disseminate information that already exists. You know, it's kind of like old and new at the same time. And that, that to me is kind of, I'm excited <laughs> about ways to um, connect with the community, to kind of engage with the community that I wouldn't necessarily have access to uh, and, and kind of learn and then share, uh, share stories, you know, share stories and knowledge. Which I guess is kind of one of the thing that you started working with from the very get go, that idea of like um, learned and communicated. I know that there's a couple questions in the huh? form and then Jane, mm -hmm. Jane's mm -hmm. iPad has its hand up. He looks so much oh. like Daddy. Yeah, yeah, he does. There's one over there. You know, they lost one before him. I know. Uh, I think That's somebody is unmuted like without. Uh, but so does Tommy. Look like Bill. Hi. Yeah, I can. I mean, yeah, we can hear. Uh, if if yeah, if. Uh, I'm not sure whose it is. I couldn't uh, figure out how to say where I'm from. <laughs> oh, so is chat, this... got it. <laughs> oh, was he? Yeah. Julesy. Julesy. Is this Jane? What? Is this Jane's iPad talking to us right now? Yes. Uh, hi. I think you. I thought you had a question. Do you have you have your hand up in a in a screen? Do you have a question right now? 
Oh, sorry, I'm not good at this. I just want to say thanks, Alex. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <That's wonderful. laughs> um, I, I do see some other questions in the in the chat. Um, That's so right. I'll, I'll read. Go see them. us. Um, so I see uh, how has uh, COVID-19 affected glass making? Are there any plans to work on alternative materials because of it? Um, you know, absolutely. I mean, There's I mean, Julesy. I think, uh, here. There's Julesy. There we go. Um, you know, I, I think all, most glass uh, resources are closed right now. You know, I think the place where the primary tool is like shared among people's mouths is, is you know, is not uh, um, advisable or, or uh, viable uh, facility to keep open during right now. So, um, but, but fortunately, and, and why kind of residency opportunities like this are so exciting is that um, I like to have work determined by kind of the resources and, and environment that, uh, you know, that I get to, that I get to be in. Um, it's kind of part of that, uh, that notion that, uh, of, that of working in this way that's very project-based, where instead of having like a particular process or um, material that I always do no matter what, instead like glass becomes this, again, this kind of like methodology or, or, or approach to other materials. And um, so the questions, I, I think like some of the questions would be, you know, like how do I, I don't know, work with, you know, with fiber in a glassy way, or, or, you know, how do I work with kind of like what's immediately available to me? Um, like, like everybody else, I'm, I'm mostly, you know, staying home right now, but I am fortunate that I, I you know, my studio is, uh, is where I live. So we're still able to, to do a lot of stuff. It's just different, different kinds of stuff. And um, there is also this wonderful um, thing afforded by the TV show, which is having a big audience uh, via social media. So I'm able to do these kind of more uh, participatory projects with like large with large groups of people that I wasn't able to before, and that's been something that I've been trying to engage with a lot uh, during this during this time. Which is very very timely, I guess. This idea of connecting. I mean, it's a it couldn't be a better setup really to have your studio behind you and a and a and a ready made kind of connection to a much broader audience than you had a year ago. I can see Kathy joined the forum and was waving at us, speaking of blown away, the hey, judge. <laughs> Hi Kathy, so nice to have you here. Um, um, Gosia had a question at the top there. Have you faced obstacles in connecting your ideas with your overall statement or medium of choice? That's a pretty tricky question. That is, that is and it's a good question. Um, you know, again, and, and maybe, you know, maybe you can tell me if this is, <laughs> if this is a problem, but I, I've never been concerned with trying to make work fit, you know, within a, a preconceived parameter, like to say, I, you know, I, to say, I like to make work about panopticons and then kind of like, you know, only do that. In, instead, um, I'm really invested in this idea of kind of uh, serendipity and kind of finding connections uh, between different uh, sites and objects around me and through history. And I find that that's a lot of what um, what this kind of practice and research is. It's, it's, it's kind of uncovering these connections that already exist, you know, and, and um, rather than saying like, you know, this is a theme that I, um, you know, that I, that I privilege um, with, with everything that I do. I, I believe in that kind of my, um, my unique experience or like kind of the way that I uh, specifically see the world is, is enough of a way to kind of tie these things together. Um, so that's, uh, that's the first part. I'm sorry, I think I missed the other, oh, is there, is, no. I can't find the rest of it. Can you read the, uh, can you remind you, me of the... This was um, the question by Garcia, which is, have you faced obstacles in connecting your ideas with your overall statement or medium of choice? Okay, yeah, so the first part was like overall statement, the second um, medium of choice. You know, the wonderful thing about glass is that um, it kind of does all these things inherently that I'm, interest, that I'm interested in, you know, um, it is, um, I've kind of mentioned this before, but like, uh, you know, this notion of like absence and presence, um, 
measuring, encapsulating, and viewing the natural world, um, the history of science and the history of technology is all mediated through this material. If you kind of think about it, um, every technological advance, every kind of scientific discovery, it's been mediated through glass. Like anything really small that we discovered through kind of optics, anything really far away, um, the, all the kind of technology that we're uh, communicating through right now, you know, it's through this intermediary of a glass screen. So in some ways, I'm very fortunate that, that all of these interests um, live in this one kind of magical material. And so you don't really have to, I, you don't really have to make it up. You know, it's kind of, it's all, it's all there. Um, if we just kind of like look and, and see what glass already does. Yeah. And if I can add to that, like, I think you're, the way you're, kind of throughout been questioning um, you know, ideas of transgressing boundaries, um, uh, uh, contemporary versus anachronistic technologies, um, the private public, all of those things are so well suited, inner, outer, public, private, time and technology, all of that is encapsulated in that description of glass. It's, it's threads, the whole kind of history of technology for humans and is the boundary that we are mediating um, and I, and experiences I think, and through. So. And that's, and that's a really, um, I'm glad that you brought that up, this kind of idea of glass as both kind of anachron anachronistic and like kind of cutting edge, um, which is also kind of at the root of my interest in the, in the project, you know, that I'm, uh, or one of the, one of the kind of central parts of the project that I, mm -hmm. Uh, we'll be doing with you. I love that this that glass is both this kind of super high tech and super ancient material at the mm. same time, mm. um, and a material that's like both a natural material and a, a made material. Um, mm. You know, I, I guess we could we could go on. Yes, um, we could, and we will. I'm sure our students here will just have an earful next semester. But um, <laughs> Robin asked, "Do you see potential to work with Indigenous Australians and their perspectives?" Which where are you from, Robin? Are you based in Australia or are you overseas? I'm based in Australia. Okay. Hi, Robin. Hi. Hi. Hi, hi Robin. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't really want to uh, presume, you know, until I kind of start connecting um, with, you know, connecting with the community. And um, I do think it's important, you know, when, when working with a community to kind of have that community be interested in working with you. Um, at the same time, I, I would expect that like a great repository of, of kind of uh, knowledge on this topic, you know, about the specific sites that I'm interested in would, would be in the indigenous community. And I would, you know, absolutely love nothing more. Um, I, I mean, I expect that regardless, my research will take me to, to not, you know, indigenous knowledge. Um, and, and I think it's just a question of, you know, like, who, who I can engage with and how much, but yes, absolutely. I think that that would be. Um, yeah. Right and I think uh, Robin, just to answer in the scope of the capacity I have right now to answer that question too. Like I know that there's a lot of interest in connecting with local communities here and CMAG in Canberra will be um, definitely involved in helping us um, establish um, form for dialogue and perhaps opportunities in in uh, locations around Canberra. So that would be really great for us to to have that um, way of creating opportunities for dialogue and exchange with all the artists and repository of knowledge around around Canberra. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, very excited. Tara, you have a question, Tara Lynch. Knowing the performance work you've done in the hot shop, do you have any plans to do any performance work in this new world we have? Oh my goodness. Well, you know, I mean, immediately, you know, so, so obviously I'm, I'm teaching through all of this. And as I think many of us um, who are educators kind of had this moment to, to kind of suddenly have to reinvent um, you know, the way that we do glass learning um, to do in a safe and remote way. And um, I, you know, I, th I think my version of that obviously could, uh, you know, 
it'll take some fine tuning. And, and I think, you know, if this is something that we choose to or have to do again in the future, there are certain things that, um, you know, would evolve, obviously. But um, that's really kind of the first thing that comes to mind is, is this, this practice that is so based in kind of working in close proximity to one another, like a team sport, really, you know, of art making um, and trying to think about doing it remotely. And some of the things that do occur to me are like, could you get somebody to like blow in a computer on one end and it inflates the glass, you know, in your studio in another country or another time zone? You know, I mean, obviously you can. There was um, a good uh, group when I was in graduate school called Tangible Media that was very much about that. Like, how can you kind of touch over um, a long distance or, or you know, kind of interface digitally without like keyboard and mouse, like more kind of um, intuitive and in many cases like physical interfaces. So um, I think that's, I would expect to see a lot of that, you know, mm. not just from me, but I think in general, I think um, there is this kind of great uh, history and, and interest in kind of these performative aspects of glass making. And I think, uh, yeah, I think I think we will see a lot of kind of new uh, performative work kind of reacting to this. So that's, a, I think that's a great question. I hope, I hope you're, you know, you're thinking about it too. I think because we're running about 15 minutes late, we might have, this might be a good spot to finish um, our chat this morning, this evening. It's getting on 9 p past 9 p.m. in Philly. Um, thanks, June, for the comment. And Yes, please, uh, before you log out, just let us know where you were. Absolutely. Uh, chat chat uh, reactions are most welcome. <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks so much, Alex. We'll be talking again. There will be a follow-up discussion about your residency um, next in the next half of the year, which will be second semester for ANU. And uh, we'll invite everyone. This is a new forum. So, um, but hopefully we'll be a live talk <laughs> in <laughs> one of our lecture theaters with performative embodied <laughs> uh, discussions. Um, well, I thank, thank you so much for arranging this again and for having me. And thanks to the, um, you know, to everybody who tuned in whatever time zone you're in. Uh, you know, I think for early people and for late people and everybody and, uh, you know, let's stay in touch. It's great to talk to you. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>